So, Dr. Stacey Sims, hello and welcome, and thank you very much for being our first guest here. Stacey's joining us from her home in New Zealand. Stacey, how are you doing down there today? Uh, pretty good. No rain. Surf's good. People are out and about. So, um, yeah, it's a uh, second day of being able to go out. So, we'll see. It's pretty, pretty good, actually. Yeah. So, how many months have you been? You've been in lockdown and it's been pretty strict down there, right? Yeah. So, what is this? This We came out um, eight weeks, so two months. Wow. And, and you were just telling like, oh me, God, I don't know what to do. <laughs> so what's your, what's your training been like during this whole, uh, this whole period? Um, so for the first four and so weeks we had, uh, like you could go from your house and stay local. So riding, running, and I was able to borrow some heavy weights from the gym. So I made my garage into a gym. Um, and then it started. And then after that we had, um, a little bit more availability got a little bit further so did some bigger rides um so it hasn't been too restrictive with regards to being outside plus we are in like early autumn so the weather's been pretty good yeah um yeah but i'll tell you what i went to my first real crossfit class last night and it's the first time in like eight weeks and it was just so nice for someone to be telling me what to do <laughs> and how's your body feeling today oh you know a little bit sore i think the whole country of people who went back to the gym yesterday have a bit of sore bodies today yeah yeah i did the exact same thing yesterday here in boulder so yeah i'm feeling it also today yeah it's a good feeling it is it is but uh you are quite the nutrition expert you've established uh quite the reputation these past five ten years uh obviously with the background as a sports nutritionist uh, exercise physiologist so you, i'm sure you get asked these questions all the time but um you know in triathlon especially nutrition is so important it's often considered the fourth discipline what are the kind of most common mistakes and the biggest mistakes that you see triathletes making they don't put enough thought into it um so as you just said it's the fourth discipline and people will spend money on coaches on pool entry technique bike fit bike gear the right wetsuit, but they don't invest any kind of time or education or really thinking about what it takes to fuel the body. They'll listen to a friend or they'll get pulled into some of the sports marketing of just do liquid calories. And they're not thinking about how the body might change over the course of something like an Ironman versus a 70.3, which again is different from Olympic and then sprint. And they just kind of go with whatever someone's told them to do, what they think might work. But when the race falls apart, they start going, well, I'm not fit enough. Um, you know, what happened or I'm cramping, but they're not really thinking about, wait, it's probably what I'm eating or drinking and it's not working for me. And when you start explaining it to people, they're like, oh, oh, that's right. The body's not an algorithm. You don't start right out of the swim and do the same nutrition all the way through an entire Ironman course because your body changes with its ability to absorb things with, you know, slow rates of dehydration because you can't stop dehydration and the gut perturbance and blood flow changes and all that kind of stuff. So you really have to plan it out and people don't. Right. And what are the biggest mistakes you see with people's day-to-day fueling and nutrition? Um, I think the biggest thing is people put like general nutrition and health nutrition in one category, and then they put their training nutrition in a different category, and they don't think about merging the two. And a lot of people are like, oh, I need to lose a little bit of weight, so I'll go fasted training or I'll delay my food afterwards. And they stay in this breakdown state and it backlashes. So there's the combination of not fueling appropriately for whatever session they're doing, staying in a breakdown state for too long, which perpetuates this low energy state that's coming up in conversation a lot now. Yeah. And then they're like, oh, I'm going to eat clean. I eat so well and healthy, but I'm getting slower. I'm putting on fat. What's going on? And you have to look at the big picture. It's like what you're eating and training also directly affects your gut and gut microbiome, which has a follow-on effect of how your body responds to food when you're not exercising. So it's taking the overall picture and going, okay, well, my training food, I'm going to use real food and because I'm doing a, a slower, longer distance. Or if I'm doing high intensity and it's really short, well, maybe I need some quick hits of sugar. Maybe I'll do some figs. Maybe I'll do some glucose tablets. And again, it's that whole lack of thought. People just don't put thought into what they're doing and what their body needs. Um, 
so yeah, those are the biggest things. It's it's like it all comes down to the lack of thought of what they're doing, what their training requires, even what they did the day before, and um, you know, rolling on to what you're doing in training, you want to be able to do on the race course. So yep. it's the compartmentalizing that people do so often and need to stop it. And how important is nutrition for recovery? Because you often see and hear athletes who are you know, struggling to maintain, maybe they can put together a good week of training or a good few weeks of training, but then they start breaking down or even over a course of a, of a season that might happen. And what, what role does uh, nutrition play in helping athletes achieve you know, opt- optimal recovery? It's critical because your body, the way it actually adapts is it breaks down during exercise. Right. So that's the whole thing is your body's under a lot of stress. It's breaking things down, including muscle tissue. And the way that you get fitter and recover is you give it its building blocks. And when you neglect recovery nutrition, um, you're not giving your body the the fuel it needs to to actually do those adaptations. And when people are like, oh, yeah, that recovery window isn't isn't real. Well, in resistance training, it is the recovery window is not that important because you're not becoming completely depleted. But if you're an endurance athlete and you're going out for an hour, you're depleting yourself and you need to eat afterwards in that recovery window because you have this compounding effect of not rebuilding and staying in that breakdown state. Then not only are you not doing your muscles and, and your bones and everything justice, but you also start to perturb your endocrine system. So when you start perturbing um, all the hormonal responses and flatlining um, testosterone, flatlining estrogen, progesterone, even DHEA and, and growth hormone, then your whole body goes into kind of a, 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 a more of a a breakdown and, and uh, a lack of recovery in a chronic stress state. So you're not going to build faster. And you'll see it. People will have two or three weeks of really good training and then boom, they flatline and, and they can't can't produce anything else for another month. And it has to do with the strategies around their nutrition and training and their recovery and nutrition. So what is, uh, if I was an athlete coming to you, asking you for the best recovery, you know, what's the best thing for me to do for my recovery after, a, you know, an endurance workout? Um, you know, you just mentioned the recovery window. So tell us, yeah, tell us what you would ideally like to see athletes doing after a, a solid endurance workout. Um, so for women, we have a little bit of a shorter window than men. So we have around 30 minutes and men can can lag a little bit up to an hour. So right. basically I, I try to get everyone in that 30 minute window, knowing that there's going to be a little bit of fudge factor. And I try to get them to eat something with protein in it, um, primarily to get amino acid pool circulating and get it elevated because the there's an effect of, of hitting the brain with some amino acids to help with central nervous system fatigue. Um, also jumpstart muscle um, protein synthesis and recovery, plus some of the amino acids getting into the muscle, as well as a little bit of carbohydrate to help with the glycogen recovery. Um, there's a lot of people who go first for carbs, and all they're doing is is recovering the glycogen. But if you're doing protein with a little bit of carbohydrate, you're hitting so many other factors, and you're also opening up that window of um insulin sensitivity. So you have a a longer window for carbohydrate replacement. So if I were to say to you, okay, well, if we're looking at macronutrients, no one's going to pay attention to what's 20 or 30 grams of protein. So I'd say, okay, after a really hard endurance workout, so you did a 90 minute tempo run. When you come in, make sure that you have um, a bowl of yogurt or you can water it down with some almond milk. So you're you're looking at what some real food options. Some people yep. can't eat after a, a heavy, strong workout. Well, this is where some um, protein powder recovery aspects come into play. But it's really just something that's easy to digest. It has protein, a little bit of carbohydrate. Get it in, then it opens up your window for your next real meal. Yeah, and all the while you're helping, you know, you're supporting the, the work you've just done so you can build on that for the next session and the next session and the next session and so on. But Yeah. So... Tell us a little bit about your experiences as an athlete, because I know that they led you into this field of researching more about women's uh, physiology and women's nutritional needs. And that's really obviously your your chief focus nowadays. But tell us a little bit about how you how you got there. Oh, it's been an interesting road. Um, 
as a collegiate athlete, I was a rower on um, rowing for Big Ten, and we would often do the same kind of training as the men. And the women's boats, well, our boat, we would sometimes not be right on par as the men. And we we're like, well, I don't understand because we're doing the same kind of training. We're doing the same kind of taper for the same races. Um, but then at the same time, I was in ex phys classes and started asking questions and found out that most of the stuff that we know um, is just based on male data. So that kind of drove the research side of my entire career, really asking questions and understanding why. And from being a collegiate rower, I got into Ironman, raced Ironman at a, a relatively high level, then got into professional bike racing. And the same kind of ongoing conversations were happening like the women were like why can't i do this i'm feeling flat i'm not recovering well and the answers weren't there so at the same time of being a high level athlete i was able to be in academia to be able to answer the questions or look and see who was doing the research so i kind of fell into it more of a selfish scope of trying to get the answers for myself and my teammates but then realizing that wait none of this information is out there so let's just keep pushing it out yeah. And I mean, and now you are kind of like a trailblazer putting that information out there and really helping so many girls and women with their, with their training, with their performance, with their recovery, with all, all aspects of it. And um, how, how close do you think we are to uncovering the right kind of data to help support women's training and fueling and performance? Are we, are we there yet? Are we, are we just starting down the road? We're at the very start, really, because... Um, I, I have these ongoing conversations in academia where people will cherry pick different articles and say, well, look at this. There's no difference. Why do you keep saying there are sex differences? I'm like, look at the scientific design. These are not appropriate scientific designs to actually pull out sex difference information. And so it was like the previous research up to about four or five years ago, um, bar a few good studies, that was more just an eye to women. It wasn't actually considering the different physiological aspects and menstrual cycle. So we have to redo a lot of studies and we have to look carefully at scientific design um, now. And I'd say the real robust data that's coming out is in, in strength and, and strength development. When we look at... Um, more of the nutrition scope, there's a little bit more scientifically sound data coming in on protein and carbohydrate, but we still have a long way to go because not only do we have like perimenop or premenopausal women on who are naturally cycling, then we have all the different types of hormonal contraceptions from an IUD to combined contraceptive pill. Then we get peripen perimenopausal women, and then we get menopausal women. And all those are different phases and right. different aspects that women have to be considered in. So we're just at the beginning of, I'd say, a really good tipping point for research to dial in what's happening for women. Um, so it's been exciting to see what's happened over the past about four years in this space. And I think with more of the globalization of women in sport, we've been able to get a lot of leverage for the research angles. And so I'm excited to see that more and more research is coming out to support women's physiology. Yeah. And so you just touched on there, the different aspects of, you know, you mentioned the menstrual cycle and how this affects women and their training. And one of the things that you've been quite involved in recently is encouraging women to try to track their menstrual cycle uh, with their training to, to get the, the most benefits. So I know you've helped a few professional cyclists, female professional cyclists. And so tell us a little bit more about that and, and, and the impact that can have. Yeah. So, I mean, if you don't track your cycle, and this is what I see across the board um, before I start working with people and they don't track their cycle. A lot of women will be like, oh, man, that that day of training was just absolutely crap. What, did I not sleep well enough? Am I overly stressed? Was I dehydrated? Did I not nail my nutrition? And not once does the idea cross that maybe it's their physiology. Maybe it's four or five days before their period starts and they just can't access carbohydrate very well. Maybe their central nervous system is a little bit more fatigued than normal. When you start tracking your cycle, it's not about uh, generalization to be able to say, hey, on day four of your low hormone phase, this is specifically what you need to do. It's being aware of where you are in your cycle and overlaying your training and you start to see some patterning because every woman's going to be a little bit more individual. But then we also know from the general scope of some of the research that's that's been done in recent time that in the low hormone phase, so we say day one's the first day of bleeding and that's your low hormone phase. This is where your body can 
um, hit intensity really well. You can get some really strong adaptations of the top end. But around ovulation, um, you need to kind of see how you feel because some women feel really like bulletproof and go out and do a really hard session and other women feel really flat until about 36 hours later and then they can do the bulletproof um, workout then you start to get a little bit more steady state and then about the five to seven days before your period starts this is where estrogen progesterone are the highest and affects every system of the body so this is why women have pms this is why they feel flat they lost their mojo and if you don't do any kind of intervention then this is the time to deload and work technique work um, movement and economy, work mobility, all that kind of stuff. So you're not beating yourself up. And as you're tracking, you're understanding this patterning, then you can also start to overlay some specific interventions to kind of level the playing field. So that high hormone state is not um, one where you can't do specific training or racing. And when people start to get that objective data, it's no longer the idea in their head of, oh, I didn't get enough sleep. I didn't eat well. What's going on? I'm not fit enough. It's, oh, Oh, every month I feel this way on this day. Right. So, so maybe I should modify. Yeah. Yep. yeah. So maybe I should modify my training on that day. And then it's just like this whole kind of different mind shift. And it improves people's perceptions of their training, their fitness. And you can use the different phases to benefit different types of training. Right. And then so you've mentioned interventions just then. What what do they look like? And what what are that? What's what's that? So if we talk about specifically what estrogen and progesterone do. Um, so it, it really, like progesterone increases total uh, body sodium loss and increases your core temperature and estrogen cross blood brain barrier and affects central nervous system fatigue and everything's inflamed because there's a pro-inflammatory response from the immune system before your period starts. So if we're looking at intervention, you're um, taking on more anti-inflammatory agents like omega-3 fatty acids. You want to increase magnesium and zinc because the endometrial lining is being built and it uses a lot of magnesium and zinc. You want to support your immune system as well. You want to add a little bit more um, sodium to your diet to counter that total body sodium loss. And you want to make sure you're getting good hits of protein with leucine in it to cross the blood brain barrier to support central nervous system fatigue. And you can do this before each training session, or you can do it at night. So it's accumulating in the body. So then those five to seven days before your period starts where most women feel really flat and bloated and fatigued, it's a non-issue because you've used different things to support all of those systems that are being affected by estrogen progesterone by kind of knocking off some of the um, estrogen receptor sensitivity, progesterone receptor sensitivity with things like magnesium and zinc and omega-3s that directly affect these receptor sites. So, and this is having a real big, you know, this is having a big impact on some athletes. I know I, I remember reading about the work you've done with uh, the pro cyclist Ruth Winder and that can mm-hmm. kind of turned around her. I mean, that's, that's caused her to win so many races, that's helped her win so many races and her season from last year to this year, you know, it's been phenomenal. So it's having a direct impact and you're having a direct impact, not just on people like that, but on the everyday athlete who might otherwise just be thinking, gee, what is wrong with me? Like, why can't I get out the door or why do I feel so bad? Um, mm, yeah. Maybe let's talk a little bit about the different diets that are out there. I say diets kind of quote unquote, but the, the fads and the trends, because I know you have some strong opinions about some of those and and they can affect women very, very differently to, to men, right? So, I mean. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I've been on the whole, like, because I pull from so many different uh, research bodies from the endocrine research, their fertility research, sports science research, and get a really big, big understanding of physiology. So when the low carb, high fat diet came into play, the ketogenic diet, intermittent fasting, all of these things, and we look at the original population, they've all been done on men and then transferred over to women. And uh, after about three or four months of women trying these, they end up at, at my office going, I don't understand what's going on. I'm getting slow. I'm getting fat. Um, you know, my training suffering. I can't race. I can't keep up. And it's because we are physiologically different from men. There's 
inherent sex differences within the muscle fibers themselves, where women have a greater amount of, of the protein required for fatty acid oxidation and mitochondrial development, which is what um, the ketogenic diet and, and metabolic efficiency diets are all about. Women don't need to do that. Physiologically, they're already there. And when we look at things like fasted training and intermittent fasting and the low carb, high fat, it directly affects um, a neuropeptide called kispeptin. Now, men and women both have kispeptin, but women have more of the neurons that are affected by kispeptin and more sensitive to it. And if you don't have enough carbohydrate, then your body perceives it as being in a more of a starvation state, which downregulates kispeptin. And the thing that kispeptin does is it stimulates um, gonadotropin releasing hormone, which is essential for menstrual cycle function. And when you start getting a perturbance in the kispeptin and then you don't have menstrual cycle, normal menstrual cycle function, then everything starts to downturn. Resting metabolic rate goes down. Um, you get menstrual cycle irregularity. Um, your thyroid starts to get a little bit uh, dysfunctional. So it's all in this conservation mode. So women will put on fat, lose their cycle, and the answer to that normally in our Western society is I need to eat less and train more, which compounds the issue. Whereas right. men, they don't have the same thing. They get lean, they get fit, they get fast, they get to, to use more fatty acids. But women are already at their max fatty acid oxidation capacity from sex differences in the muscle as well as estrogen's effect on metabolism. Um, and I'm really excited to see this paper that came out from Louise Burke last week, where she goes through the ketogenic diet and low carb, high fat, and who's it appropriate for. And the data in her paper, as she's gone through different studies she's done, still doesn't support it for women in performance. I was right. like, great, I'm not the only one saying it. Now there's other people who have data to support it and are putting out as well. Right. And that is huge because I feel like up until fairly recently, like within the last three, four years, it was still perfectly acceptable for female endurance athletes to th just assume that if they had lost their period or their menstrual cycle was completely irregular or whatever, that was just part and parcel of being an endurance athlete. And this, and I'm not talking about elites. I'm talking about age groupers. I'm talking about Everyone. anybody, anybody that does any decent, um, you know, high level amount of training volume and volume and intensity. Um, and I think you've been a key player in changing the conversation there. Um, so tell us, I mean, tell us a little bit more about how you've done that and, and how you've managed to communicate to the wider world that it's not okay. If, you know, if there's, there's something wrong, if you're not having a regular menstrual cycle, you can train 30 hours a week and still have a regular menstrual cycle if you are doing things right. Yeah. But, but there's a lot of people who, who, who uh, you know, up until fairly recently would have disagreed with you. Oh, yeah. Oh, I, oh, yeah, I know. I mean, even in a sports medicine conference I was at in November, one of the top officials from um, one of the national sporting organizations was like, well, we know our women are ready to perform when they've lost their period. And we're like, what? <laughs> no, 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 no. So it's still prevailing, right? Um, I think when... I started going out saying, if you don't have a period, you're not a healthy athlete. Like that is almost as strong a catchphrase as women are not small men. Cause people are like, what do you mean? Right. And it's like, well, if you don't have your period, then it's an undercurrent that you're not adapting. Well, like something is wrong and putting yourself on an oral contraceptive pill is not the answer because we still don't know what's going on because it's a withdrawal bleed. So if we look and say, okay, well, as soon as you start overtraining and under fueling, um, this is where you start to get that menstrual cycle dysfunction. And so you can see it when you start having irregular cycles. You have the time to pull back and understand what's going on before you get on the other side, the deep end where you just can't come back from it. Um, and when you're looking at the implications of health, like women who've been um, amenorrheic for years in their career and they're getting bone um, stress and, and bone fractures and, um, you know, they're just not performing well. And they're like, I don't understand what's going on. It's like, well, your body is shut down. Your endocrine system isn't working properly. And it's a, t it's a time and a place to really fix this. And it's possible to fix. Right. And what is your first advice to a woman who comes to you and says, I've lost, I've lost my period or my period's super irregular. I mean, what, what is your, what are your go-to questions and, and how do you help her? Um, I try to understand um, a lot of 
the cultural context around food. So with women, there's lots of different nutrition and food issues. Um, and as dietitians and other physiologists and sports scientists don't look at the the context and culture around it. So understanding where someone's coming from and how they apply that to their daily life and understanding, are you training to get fit or are you training to lose weight? Right. Why are you training? What what are the motivations? And when you understand the motivations, then you can put different practices into play. So most of the time, people aren't timing their nutrition with their training. And the longer you stay in that breakdown state, the longer your body's perturbed. Even if you bookend calories on either end of the day, but you have a long hole where you haven't recovered well, your body still goes into that conservation mode and we want to stop that. So the first step is really getting them to understand you want to fuel for what you are doing before and after. And then there's room to play with the rest of the food in the day if you're trying to lose some body fat, if you're trying to bring some weight down. But it's a it's a careful, measured approach um, because as soon as we start getting that cortisol down and getting the body to understand there is fuel available for training and for health, then you start seeing a luteinizing hormone surge come back, which is the first step to getting your, your period spec. There's a controversy um, where recreational athletes should stop completely and do nothing for three to four weeks and eat 2,500 calories a day. Oh, wow. And uh, like just looking at your face there, it's like, what woman is going to do that? Right. Right. Like, <laughs> <clears throat> and could you imagine me going up to Ruth Winder and being like, Hey, yeah, I know you have this professional contract, but we need you to stop doing everything for three to four weeks and eat 25 calorie or 2,500 calories a day. It's not going to happen. Okay. So we look at the Delta change, right? So we look at how much energy is outputted, what do you need? And really pull it back to a max of eight to 10 hours of training a week and being very specific about that training, looking more of functional movement, strength development, lean mass development, and maybe a couple of very short key top end sessions, but not that long, slow stuff. That's really depleting. Okay. And we pull that back and match nutrition for the training and the calorie intake comes up and the ex, um, the calorie expenditure comes down, but there's often a lot of body weight composition change and weight loss that happens because cortisol's down and the right. body gets into a more relaxed state. And then the woman's recovering from training and from a nutritional standpoint. And after about three months, periods back, she can put some more training in and she's had this period where she hasn't lost fitness. She has just kind of recovered a bit more. And so it's not taking a big chunk. So we were able to do that with Ruth. She was still racing, but we were modifying training and nutrition. So she was able to recover why she still had this contract. Um, so yeah, it's, it's an individual state to see context, the training, what the goals are and how we can manipulate training and food around training to match what the woman really holds dear because nutrition is such a cultural and, and such an inherent, um, like ideal really to yep. so many people that you can't just tell them you have to do this, 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 like you break an ankle and a doctor goes, you're in a cast. You can't do this for six weeks. You're like, okay. But if someone comes to you and, and is having nutritional problems and training problems, you can't be like, okay, you have no period. You can't exercise for four weeks and you have to eat this amount of food at this time of day. No one's going to do it. Right. So yeah. You, yeah. It's, it's timing the message and landing it right for the right person. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And then tell us a little bit about your thoughts on fasted training for men and women. Cause I know that's, that's very popular, especially for triathletes who do early morning sessions. You know, they often go into an early morning swim workout or whatever, which can sometimes be pretty high intensity. And some people don't eat much or they eat nothing at all. And what are the different ramifications for that for men and, and women? So for men, um, they'll activate more of the mitochondrial protein to develop that fatty acid oxidation and the, and the fat metabolism and everything that fasted training purports to do. But for women, it just increases cortisol and it has a counter effect where it increases sympathetic nervous system drive, um, heart rate goes up, it's really hard to recover, and there's a stimulus to put on body fat. So men can get away with fasted training and can lean up and get fitter, um, and we see it across the board. 
board. But for women, when they do fasted training, the back half of the session is going to be one that's lagging. So it's kind of like doing um, junk miles in the pool um, right. where you're just not going to get a training adaptation. Cortisol is too high. Sympathetic drive is too high. And you're just pretty much hitting yourself against a brick wall. So having it just a small amount of food before you go to drop early morning cortisol so that you can get in the pool and do your set and hit the intensities that you want because it's a whole idea of getting up at 4 30 in the morning to get into the <laughs> pool at 5 15 right we're not doing it because it's super fun we're doing it because we want to get an adaptation so for women who aren't eating something small or don't have something on the pool deck to just fuel a little bit during that intensity they should have just stayed in bed because the adaptations aren't going to happen. Or if they do happen, it's going to be a long, slow haul to get to those adaptations. Whereas men, it's a different story. Right. It sounds like that's what we're hearing a lot here. You know, when it's fasted training, it's keto, whatever. So different. Women are not small men, as, you, as, you've, yeah, as you've said exactly. so often. So tell us yeah. about where, that, where did that phrase come from? Obviously, it's a phrase that you're so well known for now. But where did, where did, you, where did that come from? Where did it originate? Um, it originated teaching first year students at Stanford <laughs> because a lot of them would come in not so engaged. And so you got to find some catchphrases. So I would start all my sex difference classes with women are not small men. And this is why. And when that catchphrase comes up, it wakes people up. So I just started using it a lot in my lectures and became known as the women are not small men lecturer. And then when we <laughs> You know, launched our first nutrition company and did a women's specific line and put that on the bottle. It just kind of ran. It so, sure did. Yeah. And it's still yeah. running. <laughs> I know. It's great. <laughs> yeah. Well, Stacey, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, that's all we got time for today, but we really appreciate your insights and your knowledge and your expertise. And we're excited to see all the projects you've got lined up and everything that's uh, to come from Dr. Stacey Sims. So thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been fun.